So hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. I am Dr. Via Gran. I am the chair of the San Jose State University iSchool Diversity Committee and welcome to our 2020 diversity webinar series. This is our eighth session uh, for the 2020 series and our final session for the year. Uh, our series focuses on diverse topics from diverse speakers and is really for university students, faculty, staff, alumni and affiliates of SJSU. And so I wanna do some little housekeeping. Um, you'll be able to find a full list of our recorded sessions, including this one, by visiting our SJSU iSchool YouTube channel at youtube.com backslash, backslash SJSU iSchool. And I placed it in the chat and we'll also place it there again. But when you subscribe, you'll automatically be notified of any new content. So once this recording is available, and I do want to point out that there is a diversity webinar series playlist. So you can listen to all of the uh, diversity series if you wish. Uh, if you have any questions during today's session, please place them in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat throughout as well as at the end for our speaker. And if you do identify with BIPOC, place an asterisk before your question as we will be following the progressive stack technique. And this gives marginalized groups and voices a greater chance to speak. If you want to chat with others or just post comments in the chat box, make sure you select in the little drop down carrot, all panelists and attendees. Otherwise your messages will only come to uh, Max and I. So with that, I think that takes care of our housekeeping. I would like to welcome all of you. Thank you for joining us. And now I'm going to introduce our speaker. Today we have Max Macias, part-time instructional and librarian at Portland Community College. And Max will be sharing with us moving beyond diversity to anti-oppression. So Max, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hey, thanks a lot. Hey. Thanks so much for having me. I want to thank Dr. Villagran and, and San Jose State too, and, and everybody for being here. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I have a presentation. All right. Is everybody seeing this? Looks good. Okay. I did something. Whoops. Okay, there we go. I got a new computer. It's like really touching. Yeah, so moving beyond diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I think that, uh, well, for me, I, I, I went and I moved beyond for a while. Um, I don't want to insult people that are into EDI. It's important. But for me, I've, I've come to a conclusion that anti-oppression, anti-racism is the work that needs to be done, mostly. So that's what this talk is going to be about. Give my land acknowledgement here. We're on stolen land. It's a spoil of ge colonial genocide. Unrepentant colonial genocide. We should think about what that means. Got some notes here I'll re read off. So let's take a minute to, to recognize this and ponder and reflect on how it impacts library science, education, and the society we exist within. This is kind of a huge deal. How does this impact information, knowledge creation, and learning? Just take a second to think about that. The reason I'm having us to think about this is because we don't talk a lot about genocide in our culture. And this is a culture that has been it's based on genocide. So I think it's quite important. So a little bit about me, Max Macias. You can read this stuff here. So all of these aspects impact my views and my analyses. I like to be upfront with people and, and tell people who I am and, and how I see the world. Now, my background is I have an undergraduate degree in philosophy from the University of Portland. I was super infatuated with Western culture at that time. 
but uh, I think the critical thinking and self-reflective skills have really lent themselves to, to everything that I do. Um, been a member of the ALA President's Task Force on Equity, Diversity, Inclusion. I was a member of the ALA President's Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Implementation Task Force. And that's a little bit about my background. I've been a librarian since 2009 officially, got my library degree then, but I've been working in libraries since 1987, so a long time. What does anti-racism mean to you? Racism and anti-racism mean different things to different people, or friends, family, colleagues, etc. What does it mean to you, to your friends, your family, your colleagues, right? To get a sense of our ideas, let's share on this Padlet that I have. Dr. Villagran, can you share this link in the chat? I'm gonna click on that and it's gonna bring you, when you click on the link, it's gonna bring you to this page and you can click this plus sign to add a little snippet about what you think racism is and what anti-racism is racism is. So let's just take a minute to, to populate this with some ideas. No ideas are wrong. This is just a this is just where we're at. In this journey uh, it, that I that I'm on, I've I've really come to the conclusion that it's uh it's a uh, it's a journey. It's not like I'm gonna get to the end of this anti-oppression or diversity work. It's, it's just ongoing all the time. This is to help us see like the different viewpoints that people have in this group here. We have 81 people, that's great. Thank you so much. And people are going off on it, awesome. Systematic oppression to a group of people. This is racism, bias beliefs about a specific race, system that favors whiteness over all others, the attitudes, et cetera, power structures, nice. Just take a, a minute, a few minutes here to, to do this. I like to be interactive. This is an interactive section of the, my presentation today. There'll be more interaction, but I wanted to hear from you all. And we'll share this link out uh, later on. It'll be available. Keep it up. Awesome. All right, it looks like people have stopped typing. So I think I'm gonna move on. Um, just like to see where people are at and like other people to see where they're at and just think about it. All right, thank you so much. So I read this book about a year ago and uh, it really had an impact on me and really kind of changed the way I thought about about racism and anti-racism. And I have a Kenny's, uh, oh, right, great, great. I have a Kenny's definitions here. He's so nice and clear. Racist is one who's su supporting a racist policy through their actions or inaction or expressing a racist idea. An anti-racist, one who is supporting an anti-racist policy through their actions or expressing an anti-racist idea. So, Anti-racism is not EDI. Not being racist is not anti-racism. In fact, nobody in the Americas can escape being a racist in some way. We've all been impacted by racism. And I would venture to say that we're all, we all have racist ideas in our heads because the culture that we grew up in is fundamentally based on racism, racist classifications, etc. So being racist is being anti-racist is actively working toward creating a society that does not view individuals as representations of their entire people. Being anti-racist is being actively engaged in bringing about this change in your organization, in your lives, in your communities. We must root out the idea that certain groups of people are superior by their nature and force structural change in our workplaces, organizations, and society. Being anti-racist is actively working towards creating a society, a society that does not view individuals as representations of their entire people. That's huge. Those are the definitions I'm working from. Move on. 
So anti-racism is a way of thinking. Acknowledge and understand that we exist in a society that has been shaped by racist ideas, policies, practices, laws, and organizations. Anyone who has been raised in the Americas has been raised in a world that is based on skin color and revolves around the concept of whiteness. Whiteness is it's the best, the highest state. No. Whiteness here is being the idea that people from Europe are the most important, most intelligent, and highest form of beings on the planet. That's my definition of whiteness. Therefore, being as white as possible leads to the aforementioned advantages and in, in importance. It's advantageous to partake in whiteness, right? That's, that's how the whole thing works. <clears throat> the farther away one is from whiteness lends itself to, to negative characteristics. Being slavish, whoa. Being slavish, let me get back to my, my words here. Yeah, being slavish, inhuman and stupid and being less important among many other negative characteristics. To acknowledge this, to become conscious that one must have biases and unconscious beliefs as a result of being raised in the Americas, this is hugely important and this must lead to critical self-reflection. Anti-racism is critically reflective. Being aware that one must have racial biases and in effect be racist to a certain extent, I'm saying these things over and over again because it's important, they're important. If one were raised in the Americas, it's the first step to becoming anti-racist, acknowledging this, right? One must critically reflect, reflect on one's ideas, behavior, body sensations, and relationship with BIPOC if one wants to advance towards anti-racism. Only when someone becomes conscious of their behavior and ways of thinking can they then work on fixing that behavior and thought. Being anti-racist also means actively listening to criticism when others call you out on your racism, right? This is such an important aspect of being anti-racist. In fact, I would say that you can't be anti-racist if you don't do that. I've had friends call me out and my first bodily feeling was anger, denial and mistrust. But after backing away for a bit and reflecting and really listening to the critical words and ideas about my racist behavior and way of thinking, I was able to hear their message of love to me. And it really is a message of love if someone feels the need to call you out on something. If they didn't care about you, then they wouldn't say anything. I've been able to see problem areas related to racism in my life because of my loving friends who have helped me see where and what I need to work upon. It's a big deal, it's a big deal. So like, I'll tell just a real quick story. Get away from my notes for a second. So when Kobe Bryant died, I was like, oh, oh man, and I was on Facebook at the time, not on social media anymore. I was like, oh man, Kobe Bryant, the guy's a rapist, man. Blah, blah, posting stuff about him being a racist, right? One of my friends is like, hey man, you're being racist, Max. I'm like, no, I'm not. That guy's a racist. I'm not a racist, he's a rapist, right? And they're like, mm, I'm not gonna argue with you about that, but you're being racist. Think about what you're saying. Think about what you're doing. So I stepped away for a day, thought about it, and I came to the conclusion, yes, I was being racist. Now, the rapist thing is separate from what I'm talking about. What I was doing was I was castigating a black man after he'd been, after he was dead, which is a racist act that racists participate in in the US almost daily, you see it. I realized that and I was able to go, wow, I was being racist and I took all that stuff down. I'm not saying don't go after rapists. I'm saying acknowledge your racism and deal with it. That really helped me think about the way I think. And I was really grateful to my friends for taking the time and having the patience to talk to me, talk me through it. So just one little bit of a self-confessional type of thing. I, you know, we're all impacted by this stuff and I like to be open about it. So racism has everything to do with denial. So does anti-racism. You got to get out of the denial. Denial is like, it's like a drug addict. Oh, I don't have a problem. An alcoholic, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with drinking. They can't fix their problem until they acknowledge the problem. Being, racist, being raised in this racist milieu that is the Americas, it would be irrational to deny having racist ideas in my head. 
This culture is based on a strict set of racial categories with characteristics applied to each category. This culture is racist in its structures and thought. I would encourage you all to look up the Costa's paintings. Take a look at those uh, racial categorizations that were uh, created in, uh, during the invasion of the Americas. So like the alcoholic, the first thing was one must do is come to terms with the fact that we're all racist to a certain extent. And the only ad ad antidote to racism is acceptance and then an anti-racist stance. It is a disjunction. This is what I got from Kendi, what I really, it became clear after reading Kendi's book. This is a disjunction. It's you're either a racist or you're an anti-racist. There is no in between. No, oh, I'm not racist. Uh, everything's cool, no. Well, what are you doing to be anti, uh, actively anti-racist then? What actions are you doing? Getting past denial is the first and one of the most important steps to becoming anti-racist. Accept the fact that we don't have control over the systems we were born into, but that we can change these systems for future generations by becoming anti-racist. Anti-racism is a state of being. It's a way of being. Being an anti-racist requires that we act when we see policies, behavior, or ideas that racialize behavior. This means that we also analyze the structures that we operate within. The organizations we work, live, and die within have been created in a world that is explicitly racist. We have come a long way, but it is time to dismantle racism, the policies that uphold racism, the ideas, the actions, and the beliefs that are the infrastructure of racism is what we are going for here. We can all do our part, whether it's calling out racist behavior in a supermarket, analyzing deep organizational policy for racialized ideas, concepts, practices, and procedures. Everyone can do something towards making our society an anti-racist society instead of a racist society. Max, can I um, interject real quick? There's a question about the artists you mentioned and we didn't quite, uh, quite catch the name, if you thank can. You, thank you. Yeah, Costa's paintings. Costa's paintings were paintings, not by a particular artist, but they're Costa's is cast, a caste system. And their racial categorization paintings, if you've never seen them, look them up because they break down like, What's a Spaniard and a Spaniard, the baby they have is Spanish. What's a, a Spaniard with an Indian woman, the baby they have is Indio. And they have these huge, this is where we get the terms octoroon and all these like racist, like mulatto, all these terms come from this kind of stuff. Now there's, there's a little bit of controversy about how important the Costas paintings are with, with racism, but I would say it's worth looking at. It was shocking to me to see that, that those ideas are so old, but it's also a good uh, reminder of how embedded they are, how long they've been around. These ideas are really deeply embedded in, our, in uh, Western culture, in the Americas in particular. So, um, yeah, so I'll go on to the next slide. Is that cool? Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully I'd answer it. Okay, so being anti-racist requires us to it's not like a static thing. I'm anti-racist, uh, okay. You gotta do something. It's an active type of thing. It's like a verb, right? Except that we live in a racial, racialized society and have been impacted by racialization. Be actively engaged in dismantling this racialized way of thinking. Be actively self-critical in terms of racist thinking and behavior. Be dynamic and ever evolving in our anti-racist thinking. Use what we learn from our anti-racism successes to dismantle other forms of oppression. Now, a lot of times people always ask me like, well, not, not, not a lot of times always, but a lot of times people ask me, Max, how come you're stuck on racism? There's so much more, there's this and that ism, right? Yeah, there are. But anti-racism provides a model from which we can build upon and take them into the other anti-oppression struggles that we that we are, are in. So um, that's uh, that's what I try to do. So one thing to point out is uh, being anti-racist, make sure that you're not re-traumatizing people of color by making them your sounding board as you work through any sort of guilt you may have. 
being racist is not who, but what we are. And we can actively change this every day, work to change this. Think about how you can incorporate these aspects of being anti-racist into your everyday work and lives. What can you do towards destroying the racialized way of thinking and the racialized structures we exist within today, tomorrow, and that are ongoing? I like to use the word destroy because I'm not like all like, oh yeah, let's reform this racist crap. Let's destroy it and start over again. Now, some people might object to this, but this is a deeply Western culture thing. It happens all the time. If you study philosophy and other subjects, you would, you would know what I'm talking about. Um, okay, so try to think of at least one racist action you can do when you return to your duties in your organization once we leave the session. Not yet, but when, you, when we leave the session, there's more to the session here. So what is racist policy? Racist policies produce and reinforce racist outcomes. So um, yeah, like the policy to have people take racist placement tests to get into graduate school, for instance, that would be one. Uh, racist outcomes are outcomes that treat one group differently than another group. Racist policies work to maintain a racist concept of privilege. Racist policies often take the form of colorblindness racism. So try to think of any racist policies you've seen in, in a recent past. Colorblindness racism neglects reality and how racialization hurts black, indigenous, and people of color. More on this coming up shortly. It's an extreme example of racist policy for you. It's brand new, 922-2020. The administration here, past you may have heard about this, Executive Order 13950. So, whoops, I just have this super touchy <laughs> computer, sorry. So this was, pub this was uh, created by the, the, the current administration, the presidential administration, Trump, the racist in power right now. It's presented as a colorblindness thing. And they're asking for uh, no, no services that are contracted out to, to, to be scapegoating or stereotyping people, um, which on the surface sounds great, but we live in a racist society. And this, this policy is trying to get rid of diversity training, any sort of anti-racist training. I'm in an anti-racist uh, group for the Oregon Library Association that we uh, were uh, allocated money to create an anti-racist toolkit. When this came out, we couldn't get access to that money anymore from our source. So it's actively stopping people from doing anti-racist work, diversity, equity, inclusion work even. But it's presented as colorblindness here. So it's a racist policy. Uh, they're using false race neutrality doublespeak is what I would say. It's presented from a, a post-racial point of view. We're not post-racist, post-racial. It assumes that racism no longer exists and that the racism of the past has no impact on today. Now, there was something in here that says, uh, uh, blaming members of a race or sex for, for certain things, fault or blame. I, 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 I've never seen that ever in any of the trains that I've been in. And pointing out historical fact, yeah but not like you're white and you deserve all the blame. I've never seen anything like that. So anyway, so this whole thing is a denial of causation. Anybody that believes in cause and effect, to me, it seems like would be against this. So I'll go on here. These Dr. King is a prop for racist ideas based on false neutrality. The criminal justice system numbers do not back this whole thing up that we're in a post-racialized system. The racialized economics of the US don't back up their claims. Segregation based on race does not back up these faulty, faulty, faulty concepts of post-racial America, the United States. The unequal opportunities do not back these 
faulty concepts up, the unequal opportunities for BIPOC in particular. The lack of BIPOC librarians does not back up these faulty concepts. This was from November 1st. It says here, police use pepper spray to break up a North Carolina march to a polling place. This looks like it was from like one of the pictures I saw from like 1958 or something, 1962, whatever, man. It looks like deep south crap. So law enforcement officers used pepper spray on Saturday, 10 31, 2020 to break up a march to a polling place in Graham, North Carolina. A decision that has caused on criticism from the state's governor and civil rights groups, it should. The I Am Change march to the polls was organized by the Reverend Greg Drumright and was attacked by the police as they marched to a polling place in North Carolina from earlier this month, or not post-racial. We need to work on our issues and that policy that we can't work on our issues, that disallows EDI training and anti-racist work prevents us from working on those issues. Got this from CNN, November 1st, black voters in 2020 are facing four updated versions of Jim Crow at the voting booth. What the, What is going on here? I thought this was the 21st century. This is just like mind boggling to me. Disenfranchisement by voter role stripping, redistricting, and severely limiting polling places in rural areas throughout the country. That stuff is going on right now. This last election, upcoming elections. The US is not post-racial and has a huge racist problem, racism problem. <sighs> the problem solution rests partially in the trainings that executive order 13950 tries to ban. Okay, so back to libraries here. Applying anti-racist analysis in the library. I'm gonna talk about a few different uh, aspects. So library policies, practices, and procedures are modeled after white normativity. What is deemed as professional and proper is determined by whiteness. People outside of the margins are expected to perform whiteness and to conceal their ethnic and or gender ide identity to conform. This leads to homo homogenization, homogenization of the profession. Sorry, even when diverse groups are represented, it is those who can perform whiteness that are most successful. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about library anti-racist statements, library fines, police in the library, hiring practices in libraries. And I would talk about collection development possible policies, but I don't think we have enough time to do to get into that. These are all aspects that really interest me in libraries that where I've seen racist policies and some anti-racist work going on. So library racist or library anti-racist statement example here. This is from Middlebury College in Vermont. It's part part of their anti-racist statement. We acknowledge that libraries <clears throat> and archives are not neutral and have served sometimes inadvertently, other times intentionally as instruments of exclusion, colonialism and assimilation. And we will identify ways both large and small to undo this harm. We review and revise outdated and racist catalog, metadata and finding aid descriptions. We will review and revise our territorial and collection development strategies to build up black and other marginalized voices. Going on for some more of their, their anti-racist statement. And this is on one of their, their welcoming pages. It's pretty, pretty good. Uh, in our physical spaces online and through social media, we will put front and center the voices, experience and works of BIPOC authors from the US and the world through exhibits and displays. Because the college archives bears a special responsibility to document the persisting injustices of our current time, we will amplify underrepresented voices by collecting and documented student activism, student experiences, experiences and anti-racist work. 
this is great. It's great. It, it is missing some things. And there is more to this statement than, than, than is here. But um, I would like to say that missing from their, from their statement is the need. Oh, well, here it is. What's missing in this, this example is the need to not be anti-racist in hiring librarians and in not acknowledging that racism has caused so few BIPOC to pursue the MLS degree in the first place, MLS, MLIS. What are libraries gonna be doing about that? What is this library gonna do about that? Libraries need to acknowledge that their staff are mostly white and that this is a problem. Land, a land acknowledgement is missing from this example. Now, I think a, a hearty discussion in libraries about anti-racist hiring, which to me means like, hey, our, our, our faculty's out of whack. It's mostly white. It's not representational of our community, of our, of our, of our student population. What are we gonna do about that? Well, usually we spend time advertising and, oh, I'm gonna advertise in these, these black hiring magazines and, and diversity hiring magazines in, List serves that are ethnically right, ethnic, ethnically uh, driven, et cetera. They're opening up, trying to open up people's uh, ability to, to come and apply for a job or, or announcing it at least, not their abilities, but just announcing it in different places. That's usually the go to method. An anti racist viewpoint would say, hey, you know, we don't have enough black librarians. We don't have a single black librarian in our faculty. So, what we're going to do. This year, we're just going to hire all black librarians until we get to parity with what we need. Then we will come back and re-examine our structure. A lot of times people will say like, well, hey, you know, uh, you can't appoint a librarian like that. Uh, the, 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 other, the other librarians will, will, will not like them. They'll think it's unfair. They got the job without deserving the job. Well, these people are already qualified for the job in the first place. The second place is, you know what? Guess what? Some people already don't like BIPOC people and having a really good job is not gonna be a problem. I'm not talking about putting people in without the support that they need because people need support. Yes, they do. But appointing is a good way to go. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. I think that they're wrong. Anyway, you can let people tell you whatever you want but <laughs> and you can believe whatever you want, but that, that's my point of view. So. Anti-racist statement, cool. Ah, there's the link here. So we'll, we'll share out this link afterwards. So another aspect of anti-racism is library fines. Library fines include interpersonal racism. They may play a role when library staff apply subjective criteria to enforcement of library policies. In the case of library fines, Staff decide whether to renew a lost item or to give a patron more time, mark it as claim return, or waive charges. These decisions are lar largely based on staff judgment where implicit bias may play a role. Institutional racism impacts library fine policy. <clears throat> it's present when a library's enforcement of fines has a disproportionate impact on people of color, BIPOC, who are overrepresented among low income populations due to the racial wealth gap. Another aspect is structural racism. It exists whatever, whenever libraries rely on revenue from fines to cover general operating expenses to the extent that people have difficulty paying these fines, negative consequences, e.g. being blocked from library and computer use or being reported to a collections agency that's horrible, are, are compounded across multiple institutions contributing to systematic barriers. So there's also another practical outcome of eliminating fines. Studies show that more materials are returned and usage, usage increases when late fees are completely removed. The information I got here is from Advancing Racial Equity in Public Libraries, Case Studies from the Field, which was published in 2018 racialequityalliance.org is where the material exists. I'm not gonna click the source link, but that's where it's at. 
So another example of anti-racist analysis is anti-racism and, and uh, anti-racist policies and, and racist policies of police in the library, right? So here's some questions. Assess how police have power in your library. Are they stationed in the building? Do they make rounds? Do you share surveillance camera feeds or footage with the police? Do you share other info with them without warrants? Do you have private security in your library? Is private security contracted through local police or through the police? Do private security guards carry weapons? Do police or security guards communicate or collaborate with library staff or do they make <clears throat> decisions and enact policy without input? So I used to get physically sick when I was in the proximity of a police officer. I mean, I would throw up really bad. Uh, you know, one of my earliest memories is, is of, of one of my uncles telling me, hey, never run from the police, they'll shoot you. It, it's kind of mind boggling to me that this stuff is still going on today. Like, and I was a kid, like a little kid, I was serious, I'm serious, it's one of my earliest memories. So are private security given anti-racist training if you have private security? Who handles mental health crisis in a library? These are all questions to think about when, when trying to apply an anti-racist analysis to uh, police and security issues in your library. I'm not providing you with any answers here. I'm providing you for something to think about and analyze. And yeah, just think deeply about it. People have different experiences with the police. My, my experiences have not been great. I, as a young man, I remember being asked, hey, which gang are you in? by the police. When was the last time you were arrested, Max? Let me check your arms for needle marks. That kind of stuff. Just, I was walking down the street and, and <laughs> got harassed by the police. They asked me all these questions, which aren't really questions, right? Uh, so the source of this information is from the Library Freedom Project. Thank you, Library Freedom Project, good stuff. So another example is anti-racist hiring policy, right? So I was looking for, I'm always looking for a job. Here's something I wanna say. Being anti-racist is not an easy thing. Being anti-racist can make you not popular with racists or people who are unconsciously racist. It might make you a target. So just be aware of that. So organizations have a hard time taking on the anti-racist moniker or the, the endeavor because they're scared of this. They know it's true. You become a target when you become an anti-racist. A target for whom? A target for racists and other people like that. So that's just, I just want to say that right off not right off the bat, but in, in, this, in the context of this presentation, that it's, it's caused me grief to be an anti-racist in, in, in some respects in the library world. I've become a pariah in some, in some respects. I graduated in 2009 and I'm still not able to get hired full-time as a librarian. And I truly believe it's because of my anti-racist anti work. So that's something to, to, to realize. I'm not saying that's for me, oh, me, poor as woe is Max, right? I have a nice IT job that pays better than most librarian jobs and I don't have to supervise anyway. So that's cool, but it's being anti-racist is, 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 um, can be a hard thing. So I was looking for jobs. <laughs> that's where I started. And I ran into this anti-racist policy. I think it's an anti-racist policy from where? from Bend, Oregon, Eastern Oregon, which is kind of a scary place to me, but like I was, I was surprised. So check this out. The college recognizes the value of skills and knowledge gained outside of formal higher education and paid employment. 
applicants who do not meet minimum qualifications but present other qualifications or experience equivalent to those required will be considered and are encouraged to apply. To qualify under equivalency, applicants must indicate how they qualify under equivalency by responding to the supplemental questions presented during the application process. That is beautiful. I love this thing because it, it takes into to, 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 uh, it looks at, at, at the reality that opportunities aren't available for everybody to have a formalized education. Opportunities aren't available for people to have a lot of professional experiences for, or BIPOC in particular, I would say. So, yeah, so this hiring statement acknowledges that racism impacts the ability to, the ability to gain formal higher education and paid employment by BIPOC and others who are marginalized. In addition to analyzing policies we can develop and advocate for and budget for and implement anti-racist policies. Analysis is not enough. We always have to be trying to figure out how to enact anti-racist policies, not just analyze. Right? So are there any questions? Question and answer period here. I wanna thank everybody for coming. Be happy to take any questions. I might not have answers for you, but be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Max. Um, if you have a question, go ahead and place it in the chat and we will get to them. I was uh, posting the links as you were speaking, Max. So they have access to all of the sources you included in your presentation. Thank you. And this, we have plenty of time for questions or discussion, any kind of comments you want to make. You know, some people might say like, well, Max, your ideas are really like, oh, they're up there or whatever, but how are you going to imp implement them practically, right? I work in a library where we can't do that. We got to have like Nazis come in and use our, our meeting rooms or whatever. I'm not telling you that you can change those like that. But what I'm saying is to think about these things and start having discussions about them. People... You know, it's, it's so striking to me to, 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 for libraries to play the neutrality game, right? They're like, oh, you know, we got to allow these people that hate uh, Black people to come into our library uh, and have their meeting, for instance, right? And maybe they'll try to get around it by saying like, oh, we have a policy that says any sort of disruption of, uh, of our regular library uh, activities, then, then you can't be here, right? They'll try to hide behind that, which, you know, it works. But why aren't libraries saying, hey, we're anti-racist, we're anti-oppression. We do not allow people that are going to come in here and intimidate people that work here and our other patrons. We're not going to allow that. We don't allow it. That's not free. It's, it's not a point of view either, right? Like people always hide behind this point of view thing. Oh, my point of view is that uh, I hate black people. Sorry, that's not a point of view. That's, that's a hate statement that's not uh free speech it's not uh any sort of like point of view it's uh you know you like vanilla and i like chocolate we can totally talk about the differences between that and that's your point of view and, and my point of view is different but when you say hey i hate mexicans <laughs> we're not going to be able to talk about that that's not a point of view i'm sorry it's a racist hateful statement so, so I don't see how libraries, you know, and the other thing that strikes me about libraries is they're awfully scared about getting sued by white people, but they're not scared about getting sued by BIPOC. So I have this grand idea to get BIPOC people, this legal fund together and, and like start suing libraries for making, for, ha for creating, you know, if your library allows hate groups into, into the library, if your school allows hate groups into the school, you're creating not only a hostile work environment, it's a dangerous work environment where somebody could get shot. A lot of these people carry guns and stuff. It's really scary. So it's not just this uh, intellectual like uh, uh, thing that I'm thinking about. It's impacting people's lives daily. You know. Anyway, enough talking, but what, what this questions, please. We actually, we have um, uh, one question so far, uh, and I think this is a great question, particularly for any students that might be joining us or listen to this later. But any advice you have to MLIS students to take anti-racist actions while in grad school? Oh, yeah, I would say that that's a great time to, to start organizing students, not just in your school, but in other schools. 
to start creating a, a movement and maybe maybe have a, a, a like the unconference, like an unconference teaching on anti-racism, anti-oppression. Right now at our school, we're trying to organize a, a teaching for the uh, winter or spring term on anti-racism. So I, I would say that start start organizing around anti-racism and and uh, work with students from around the country, not just in your school. Because one thing I've noticed is some some schools, like I went to Emporia State, and it was horrible there. Like like for 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 uh, for for anti-racist work and DEI work, it was really hard. But when I met people from other schools, was able to 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 gain some momentum and get ideas going. So I would say uh, work within your organization and outside your organization, and and I, I would say do things like anti-racism teachings, even workshop seminars. Right now we're in this virtual world. Anybody that has a Zoom account, if you're a student, you have a, a student Zoom account, you, you have, you're hugely privileged. You can, you can put on your own little conferences. So I would say do something like that. Invite guest speakers in, you know, that's one thing that I'm deeply heard about. Uh, I, I think that uh, I don't like to toot my own horn, but I'm whatever, infamous or famous or whatever you want to call it as an anti-racist librarian and Emporia State has never had me come and talk to their students ever and they, they have like local classes where they have in person classes here it really it really hurts so that's me but like what I'm saying is for you is like bring in people to to, to talk from outside of your organization if you you don't have a strong anti-racist uh, uh, faculty bring in people and, and uh, we can get get things going I hope that answers the question. Thank you well, for your question. And we welcome you with open arms at San Jose State University. Thank you. Um, and I will say too, um, just one thing for those that are here from San Jose, I'm also the college EDI committee chair and we're looking at a project on anti-oppression specifically uh, for pedagogy and looking at curriculum, but it will involve students, faculty and staff and our library liaisons. So there's a huge project coming up in the near future you'll be hearing more about. Um, there are several comments here, but let me go to, we have a lot of questions and comments. Um, let me scroll back up. Okay, here's a question. Uh, Systemic racism has been deeply rooted in the experience of BIPOC and will continue to affect their children and future generations in the form of collective and generational trauma. How do you respond to the notion of undoing racism and what can be some of the practices to address the long-term impact of racism? Great question. It's a great question. It's, it's a, it's a, it, it, it comes uh, upon something I think about a lot. It's fundamental in my thinking is, is, is can I get out of this? I, I, being raised here, you know, I talked in, in a presentation, being raised in the Americas, it's a fundamentally racist society and, and, and everything I learned went through that lens. Everything I've, 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 all my education was from that point of view. And it's only as a, as an older adult an adult and older adult that I've been able to come out of that, but I'm not completely out of it. I don't think you can escape it because it's fundamentally part of our American culture, America's, the culture in, in the Americas, not just the United States, but the Americas. The Americas, I see the Americas as being fundamentally racist place because of colonization. So I don't think you can get out of it. So then what do you do, right? What do you do? And so, you know, for a long time, I was like, oh man, I'm, I'm a separatist. I don't want to be part of this because it hasn't worked. We had far greater people alive in the 60s and 70s they were activists, they were working, and what happened to them? They were all neutralized. Things have gotten worse. So, so then, you know, what a, a rational person to me says, well, you don't keep doing something that doesn't work, you do something else, right? And to, to me, that, that else is finding how to how to be separate. And I don't think that you can start a separate country. I don't think you can do that. I don't think we can have a new Africa or different things like that. I don't think you can do that. It wouldn't be allowed by the racists for one thing. They're really good with guns. So uh, 
I would say that uh, I've been able to find rational discussions and comfort in affinity groups. Affinity groups, if you don't have them at your school, your organization, start affinity groups because you can get together with people that are have similar experiences and talk about things without having to, to constantly prove, yes, racism exists. Yes, racism exists. And get into that same discussion that happens over and over again. You probably know what I'm talking about. It wastes a lot of time and creates a lot of mental uh, unhealth for people to participate in that, especially if it's BIPOC trying to convince some white person of that, uh, uh, that racism exists. I don't do that anymore. Uh, in my consultation page, it says that I don't work with white people. Not because I don't hate white, not because I hate white people, no. It's because I truly feel like I can't convince them and it's mentally and physically unhealthy for me to try to do so. That's white people's job is to, to, to convince other white people, not my job. Uh, so um, I know that's not a great answer. It's not, not, not like a solution, but this is a philosophical question that, I, that I'm always asking myself. And um, I, I'm not gonna be a big self promoter or whatever, but my blog, Libra Lowrider Librarian, I have a lecture on whiteness and colonialism that kind of addresses that a little bit. And I have a video on information literacy and, uh, and racism. Uh, that I think you should watch, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to sh I'll share those links with with the doctor here, and uh, we'll, we'll share those out with you all. Um, I think we can we can post those after the session, can't we? Sure, we can post it with, on our website with the recording. But I did just put your uh, a link to your blog in the chat. Thanks. I, I've been doing my blog for a long time, and uh, there's there's a lot of stuff in there. If you're interested in any of this kind of stuff, I have a yeah, quite a quite a lot of stuff in there. Great resources too. Um, we have a lot of comments and some questions. So let me get to some of these. Um, I have a comment. Uh, this is from a, a person of color. In my experience, far more patrons who even ask for exceptions, et cetera, to fines appear to be white than apparent uh, POC. This could be correlated with our total usage, but it does stand out to me. Thank you for your thorough and honest presentation. Uh, another comment and a question. Uh, the library at our institution has a surveillance feel entering through electronic gates, library staff observing everybody as they enter, monitoring certain students, etc. Can you comment on this? Yeah, it is very panopticonish, right? <laughs> Even more so nowadays. Like it used to be that you can like go to the back of the library and get away from everybody now, but like now, if you do that, right, you look up and there's a little circular camera thing up there on the wall. And it's so you're like, you're constantly being watched. And like, what does that do to your behavior? And like, uh, you know, Jeremy Bentham, I think it was, did the Panopticon prison. And like, it was the idea where you're, you never know when you're being watched. So you better do the right thing all the time because you never know. So like, I think that has a lot to, that, that that's big in, in, in American culture, uh, not just with racist stuff, but it has a lot to do with racism, for sure, for sure. So, um, yeah, I, I hope that addressed the question. I don't, did I, can you re read the question? Did I get off track on that? I kind of made me uh, think about the panopticon. I was like, <laughs> boom. So um, just commenting on, I guess, your thoughts related to uh, the yeah. surveillance. Well, yeah, the, I, you know, my, my thoughts about librarians are kind of like, like how my, my thoughts about teachers have changed. It used to be that the teacher was an authoritarian and like you went to the teacher and they imparted the knowledge they had and they're like, here's the knowledge and you get the knowledge from them. And like, it was this real hierarchical thing. But now I see teaching and, and learning as like a, a give and take, a, 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 a almost an equal thing where the teacher's on, on, on an equal plane with the student because the teacher's learning all the time from the students. And it's, it's like, we're all learning. So I see libraries uh, need to be like that more. They need to be less authoritarian. Like, like if I see a cop at the library door, I probably won't even go in. Like to me, that's like, man, that's like unwelcome. They don't want me here, especially the symbol of the cop. To me, it's a pig. I'm sorry to use that term, but like I see them as 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 the 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 pigs, the they're the police. And and I and I got that term from my uncle that, that told me like don't run from the cops like that long ago. Uh and things haven't changed. So I, I would say that libraries need to be a lot less 
like that. And I think with the fines too, it's like, like, that's a big deal, man. I've, I've not gone to libraries before because I couldn't afford to pay the fine. I know how that feels. And it, it actually hurts the library, right? You're reducing the library usage. So like, I wouldn't even go there to hang out. I'd feel so bad. Like, huh. So anyway, I think that, uh, that libraries need to be a lot more welcoming in, 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 in the sense where like, I think, I think you're right. A lot of times I, I walk in a library and it looks like, it feels like they're looking for something you're going to do wrong. Where like, just like a good boss, you should like, you know, like, hey, like <laughs> empower. The library should be empowering you to find stuff and to feel free to find stuff and to feel welcome. Not, oh, if I do something wrong, they're going to throw me out of here. That's, yeah. So that's, that's my take on that. Thank you. Um, some more comments. Uh, this was such a great presentation. I really appreciate this. I was recently elected to the executive board of a small state library organization, and I've been trying to collect ideas for how to promote anti-racism when my term as president begins next summer. So this was very helpful. Um, let me see. If you're interested, if you're interested send me an email at max.macias at, at gmail.com. And I can send you info right now. I'm in, working on the Oregon Library Association's uh, uh, anti-racist task force. And we're coming up with an anti-racist toolkit that we're going to distribute. So I can, I'll share info with you. Send that to me too, Max. Um, I put your email in the chat. So everybody has your email address. Uh, I don't want to miss I have a couple more questions. Uh, what is the best way to give uh, a thoughtful authentic land acknowledgement. Sometimes I find them inauthentic and like everything, sometimes a check, you know, checking off a box. So I hope my land acknowledgement was a thoughtful, um, meaningful one because that's where that came from was seeing the same people, librarians, especially like they love to copy other people, like go to conferences, oh, I'm gonna come back in with all these ideas and stuff, but like, I got sick of seeing the same land acknowledgement and I started thinking, well, what is a land acknowledgement really? Like the land acknowledgement, <laughs> a lot of the land acknowledgements, a lot of times when I see them, it's, it sounds like it was written to make white people feel better. <laughs> Cause like they say this and then I'll feel better after I say this. And then, then it'll be cool that we killed all these people and stole all their land. Right. That's why my, that's why my land acknowledgement is like, Hey, we live on unrepentant genocidal, stolen land like what do you think about that like have people think about it. try to try to get people to think deeply about genocide because because that's what we're talking about and i would on and on my blog i got a, a book I, I i i reviewed it's called uh it's about genocide in california and about the horrendous genocide that happened in california my god uh and uh it's so shocking that people just don't know. And, and it's so, you know, what would Germany be like in, uh, you know, a hundred years after they, they won World War II uh, and uh, they got rid of all of the Jews or they took everything from the Jews, right? Like, well, it'd be like here. Like people don't even realize that we live in a genocidal culture, you know? It's, and yeah, so. That's, that's what I would say about my land acknowledgement or about any sort of land acknowledgement. It should be authentic and people shouldn't copy other people's land acknowledgements. I, I don't like that myself personally. Thank you. I'm trying to do better of that too. I now have it in my uh, courses as part of my course in the introduction, um, but I think I need to work on that. So I appreciate um, who asked the question. Great question. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, a couple more things that came in. Uh, there was another comment. Let me make sure I get to it. Uh, thanks for an energizing presentation. I'm curious if you see opportunities to incorporate anti-racism ideas, practices, and actions at the consortia level, collaboratively as, as a group of academic libraries that complement individual libraries' efforts. Oh, I hadn't thought about that, but I would say just there's just as much opportunity there as anywhere else. And I would say that the, the payoff would be, you know, a lot would be huge with that because because it just spread out right uh these these consortiums have councils that run the whole thing right they got committees and councils that, that run this stuff so maybe you can ask to get and you're getting me to think about our consortium in oregon can, you know do you have an anti-racist committee a, a dei committee and how do i get on that and 
how do we get this going if they don't have one? Uh, that would be a, that's a great opportunity. So that's what I would say about that. I hadn't thought about that. Thank you so much for getting me to think about that. Yes, I'm gonna jump on that. Yeah, and, <laughs> and you can email Max if you wanna elaborate, if you have more questions or thoughts on that. Please. Um, a couple more questions. Uh, I'm wondering about the Kobe story. Were you saying that the story you shared reduced his life to that single story? Sort of, yeah, sort of, yeah. It was, it was the act itself was an act that if, if you, if you take Kobe Bryant's name out of it, it's just Max attacking a dead black man. And, and I don't need to do that. That's, that's a racist uh, act that people participate, the racists participate in every day. I, I see it every day and uh, I, I don't need to participate in that. And uh, so, yeah, that's what I see. And, and, and I see, I, I still have a lot of work to do. And I think that it's good for people to acknowledge that kind of stuff because I hear a lot of, you know, fragile people a lot of times, oh, like, uh, you know, I don't want to work on that or I don't have anything to work on, but like everybody has stuff to work on. I agree 100%. It's all a journey. We're all on this journey together, hopefully together and being welcoming and inclusive. Uh, another com or question, what can we do to replace the Dewey Decimal System? Ah, you know, there is a, I don't have the link on me right now, but I know that there's been a work I think is in Canada that where they have a, they've instituted a indigenous uh, um, uh, classification systems in, I think it was archives in these archives. I was reading an article about it not too long ago. So I would look at other, other forms of, of classification from other cultures, indigenous cultures in particular. And, you know, a, a lot of times, like, it's weird, like American cultures, like got this weird thing where we're super stuck on Western culture. It's like, well, you can have communism or you can have socialism. And like, th they're always operating in this Western culture thing, but there's so much more than Western culture. I'm not saying, try to become African or anything like that. But like you can find things that work from different cultures and, and, and use them to create something new. So I would say, uh, look at, look at that. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the link or the name. I can't even remember it right now uh, of the article I was reading, but if you'd look, I think it's indigenous classification, like keywords I would search for indig indigenous classification archives, Canada, and it, it should probably come up. If I can find the link, I'll give it to the doctor. Somebody actually um, shared a link with us um, in the chat from bbc.ca. So perfect. Thank you. Um, I know we're a couple minutes over. I don't see any other questions. Just a few comments I'll mention um, regarding the land acknowledgement. Uh, I think it acknowledges indigenous presence too. And then another comment that Nazi Germany was based on Jim Crow laws. Oh, yeah. You know, I read a book about how the Nazis sent over their scholars to the US to, uh, to study our laws. And the Nazis actually thought that, uh, that our laws were too extreme. Like for instance, they didn't believe in the one drop rule. They thought it was too extreme. The Nazis thought our racist laws were too extreme. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we will collect all of the uh, URLs, the links that were shared in the chat uh, and post those on our website so that you will all have those resources. I want to give a hearty thanks to Max for sharing this with us. It's such an important topic. And I actually wanted him to be my kind of my end of year. Like this is the, you know, the final 2020 session. And I think it really encompasses all that I've been trying to do uh, over the year with all these different webinars and really what San Jose is doing and all the work we're working towards, right? More learning and being better in this area. And it's such a, a critical topic to everything we do. So thank you again, Max. Um, I'm sure we'll be in touch. And thank you to everyone that's here and everyone that listens to this recording. We appreciate each of you. Totally, thank you so much. I appreciate this. It's an honor, thank you. Take care. Take care.